this psalm, as we're going to see, uh, answers the question, uh, what are God's people to do when uh, their institutions are devastated by the godless? Like when the church is attacked. I'm talking about the church at large. Uh, it can be any, any denomination claiming Christ as Lord. Uh, how should Christians respond when a culture implodes uh, and begins to use their power, uh, to use their ideology to uh, control the moral, spiritual voice of the church. And indeed, they must do that, uh, as we see from Psalm 74, uh, because the church at large uh, is the moral, spiritual voice to the world. We are the speed bump. We are the check. Um, back in uh, 1933, January of that year, uh, uh, there was a man named Hitler who was basically a low-level nobody. Uh, he, nobody really listened to him, but it was shocking how fast we know from history that he rose to power. Uh, by July of 1933, uh, through intimidation, lies, propaganda, uh, he elevated himself and effaced all of his opponents, uh, and he had seized control of the country under his view of nationalism. Only one thing stood in his way. You can guess what that was. It was the church, the church. Uh, he realized that, so to consolidate his power, uh, he uh, approached the uh, 450,000 people in his country. Many of them were Protestants. The majority of them were Lutherans, uh, and they were extremely patriotic to their country, loved their country. Uh, many of them had served in the World War I as soldiers, uh, and he went to them, uh, and he realized that he had to take control of them, so he formed a new uh, uh, bishopric, bishopric, as it were. He put a, his own bishop over all of those 28 de denominations, uh, and uh, the, the people basically embraced him, the church at large, 28 denominations. Uh, he also approached, uh, sent a delegation to talk to the Catholic Church. He won their approval, and with that, he pretty much had control of the church. He took a, a man, his name was Ludwig Müller, uh, naval officer, uh, a chaplain, a no-name person, he put him in control as the head bishop of this new state-controlled church. Um, when the churchmen uh, voted uh, against his selection of, by, by his uh, powerful fiat to make him uh, Ludwig, the head of the new denominational control of the, of the churches, in, in May 27th election of 1933, uh, he, he didn't uh, uh, appeal to that too well. So once in control, uh, he uh, seized all of their offices, shut down their ability to communicate against him, uh, put Mueller in, fla in, in, uh, in place of uh, all of the leaders of the church. Uh, he demanded that Nazi flags were hung in all of the churches in commemoration of great nationalism. And he published a, a statement that was to be read in all churches which said, all of those who are concerned uh, and feel d you should feel deeply thankful that the state has... Uh, has, has assumed, in addition to all of its tremendous tasks, the great load and burden of reorganizing the church. Shocking, isn't it? Uh, not all the Christians, however, bowed to the new dictator. Uh, there were three men, three brave men. Uh, Martin Niemöller, former naval submarine officer, World War I, Hans Jacobi, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Those three men uh, were for the Church of Christ. It would not kowtow to the state. Uh, and they did their um, actions against the control of the churches in a nice, cordial, communicative way, but they were met with, met with great opposition. When you study the history of what happened to those three men, uh, we know uh, it was not pleasant. Eventually, if you study, and I'm condensing history here, they sent the Gestapo to Martin D. Muller's residence one evening when his uh, family was at home, and they knocked at the door and said they, he needed to come with them. Uh, they didn't see him again for several years because they put him in a, a prison cell. Uh, there was a chaplain who came to him while he was in the Gestapo prison who saw him as a leader of the Lutheran Church and said, uh, Herr Niemöller, why are you in this prison? He then replied, Brother, why aren't you? Amazing. They eventually hung Bonhoeffer, uh, who opposed uh, Hitler uh, and tried to remove him from his position. He eventually wrote the book, The Cost of Discipleship, which was used by many Christians over the years to, to delineate what does it mean to be a Christian in difficult times? What is the cost of a disciple? It's a profound book. Um, I was acquainted with it in the early 70s. It's been around a long time. Why do we talk about those men? Why do we talk about that time? 
because the despotic totalitarian control has been around forever. And we know from Scripture, if you're hanging with me in my Revelation study, we know from Scripture in its prophecy, uh, like in 2 Timothy 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is most explicit that in the times preceding the appearance of Christ, or at, at the times preceding the final days of the earth before Christ appears, uh, that despotic totalitarian control, according to Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, is only going to increase. But as it increases, what's in the way of it increasing? One thing. The Church of Christ, the Church of Christ. So anticipate in the days ahead uh, that it uh, doesn't matter who's in political office, that that word of prophecy is going to be fulfilled, because the church stands in the way of the advancement of that which is evil and immoral and ungodly. We are the voice, and Christ has told the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We win, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Psalm seventy-four is a, a tremendous psalm about what do you do when your culture implodes in that fashion. Because in this particular psalm, um, we're going to see, and I'm going to give you the, the cookies up front on the lower shelf, we're going to see at the be beginning of this psalm that Israel is overthrown by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And Asaph, or really one of his descendants as a priest, uh, writing after the fact, because Asaph lived in the time of David, which was not the time when the nation fell, but a, a priest after the line of Asaph is writing as a Christian man, as a priest, as a teacher of the Torah and the prophets in the temple. He's writing to tell his people, how could this have happened? How could we have allowed the Babylonians to overthrow our country? How could we allow them to come into our country and burn the temple precincts and destroy everything that is sacred? How could this have happened? This is a highly, uh, it's an emotional psalm, uh, and his requests are going to, there's three requests he's going to make, but he's going to disperse them three times throughout the psalm because he gets into the emotion of what it's like to watch that which is ungodly overtake that which is godly. It is not hard to understand his emotions because as you see this happening, I've been watching it my whole life, that which is holy being replaced by that which is unholy. When you watch this occur, you don't look at that and go, oh, that's no problem for me because I know prophecy. No, as a human, you emotionally struggle through it. And so here we're going to understand how to respond when godly institutions are attacked, and indeed they are. They've been attacked for years. Uh, when they took prayer out of school when I was a little kid, remember when you came to school and your teacher prayed for your class? I remember that when I was in, in grade school. I remember the day they stopped praying for us. And I was just a little kid. I wasn't even a Christian back then. And remember on the playground asking my friends, why, why didn't the teacher pray for us today? Well, there was some kind of court ruling. You know, you got little second graders talking about the Supreme Court on the playground. You know, and it's never been the same thing. Would you say it's improved? I th I'd say not. And so as you see things, institutions being infiltrated and things being overrun and, and, and churches acquiescing to things that you would never thought they would have acquiesced before, um, how are we supposed to process all of that? Uh, look, I want to take you through uh, the structure of this psalm, making comments as we go along to understand how to respond in days like that. And so we'll look at the structure uh, of this great passage and get into the mind and the heart of this godly man. He's going to ask and say a lot of things you can probably identify with, but he's also going to give you much needed insight for the road ahead. So let's get into what does he say? Well, in verse one, he begins what I would call is the reality of the situation. He says, this is a contemplation of Asaph. Remember, I told you it's probably not Asaph because he was, he was the priest under the time of David. This is one of his uh, descendants. It's a contemplation of, uh, of Asaph. What does he say? Oh, God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Lord, we are just sheep. Why, why have you allowed this to happen? Again, what had happened? The, the, the nation had fallen to the Babylonians. There were three attacks on the nation, if you study history. The first was in 605 B.C. That's when uh, the intelligentsia of the country, people like Daniel, were hauled away to Babylon. So the Babylonians did. They took the best, the cream of the crop of the country and relocated them for their purposes. You know, three attacks and three deportations. And finally, in 586, the, the nation fell. They infiltrated this holy uh, ground of the temple complex and trashed it. Could you imagine if you were sitting in town on one of the hills around Jerusalem watching your temple burn? Imagine the sadness, the sadness. And this is the sadness that the man has. And he says, God, why have you cast us off forever? 
Uh, the word here in Hebrew, lama, means why. It's, sta- it's put at the fr- front of the sentence. It's totally emphatic in the Hebrew text. He says why once in fa- outright, and then the second why is in italics because it's not in the Hebrew text. He's so emotional about what he's watched, he can't even articulate the second lama, why. Why, God, have you allowed this? Haven't you ever looked around at the world that you've been living in and wondered those same kind of questions? God, how in the world can you permit that? I'd never believed I would see that occur. Where are you? See, he's, he's raw and real with his emotions, and he puts it out there. So as a priest, think about it. He's asking God, like, why have you cast us off forever? This is a man who knew the Torah, knew the prophets. So he knew uh, that, that God would not cast his people off forever because he knew what the prophets said. He also would be uh, one who would know uh, from the, the Torah and the prophets that God told his people, if you don't abide by my law and if you don't worship me, I will judge you and discipline you. He knew all of that. But that it, you know, it's one thing to know theology, and then it's another thing to live your theology. And he's having to live his theology because the nation fell. He knew the nation uh, had been given many warnings. But God had been gracious for many, many years. So from their exodus in 1446 B.C. to the fall of the nation in 586 B.C., God had been more than patient with his people, calling them to repentance through men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah. He put these prophetic voices for the nation to listen to for all of those years. And what did they do? We'll study the kings, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and you will see that basically the people said, We don't like what the prophets say. We don't like what our pastors say. It bothers us. We want our own prophets. But I would say from 1446 to 586 B.C., God's pretty patient, isn't he? He's patient. What's the word for us here as we live in times that are difficult? You're going to have your own questions. Do not be afraid to articulate your why question to God because he listens to you. And he acts as we're going to see based upon what you articulate. Get that emotion out before God and lay it before him and say, God, this is how I feel in the raw. I want to be authentic with you. Are you authentic? Two, verse two is what I would call the request. He has a request from God. He says, remember your congregation, which you've purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance, which you have redeemed. This Mount Zion, where the temple is, this is where you have dwelt. Remember this. Uh, the Hebrew word here, zakar, doesn't mean just to remember something. And zakar in he- Hebrew uh, means to remember with action. So he says, God, when you remember who we are as your people, take action in our behalf. Take action in our behalf. Zakar, remember us, God, and do something about it. He says, you're the one that picked Mount Zion for the temple platform. You're the one that redeemed us as a people back in the Exodus when you parted the waters and we went through. You, you made us. How could you forget us? How could you forget us? As we think about this from our perspective at the request, you too can ask God to act in trouble sometimes. Do you? When you see evil advancing and and, and you're to be salt and light to evil, aren't you supposed to ask God big questions? God, here are my requests. Here are my requests. I wrote some of my requests down. I'll share them with you in case you need your pump primed. Here are some of my requests. Lord, will you help me to feel your presence when times are tough? Because sometimes I doesn't feel like I don't feel his presence. Lord, will you enable me to have an abiding peace even in chaotic times? Because sometimes it doesn't feel peaceful. Lord, will you show us how to defend the local church when the adversary attacks? Will you show us how to do that? Lord, will you give us a glimmer of hope in seemingly hopeless times as evil seems to triumph more often than not? Lord, well, you can fill in your home plank. But what is your request? He said, God, here is my quest. My nation has fallen. They've trashed the holy institutions of the nation. And I have some issues, God. Will you please remember us? Verses 3 to 8, he gets into what I would call the ruination, where he gets into the detail of what happened. Verses 3 to 8, he says, Lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Everything. Uh, This is anthropomorphic language. Anthropos meaning from man. Anthropos, the Greek. Morphic to change. So he's he's applying human attributes to God. So you have to ask yourself, does God the Father have feet? What say you? The answer is not yes. It's no. God doesn't have feet. He's spirit, remember? But he's saying in human terms, God, if you have feet, he tells him here in Hebrew, it's a command. 
lift up your feet. Uh, it really translates, it's an interesting translation from the Hebrew text. He's really telling God, could you stop dragging your feet? Are there some things you pray and you think you might have crossed the line? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, God, I am so emotional about this. I totally wrapped up in this. Would you do something? That, that's what he's saying. He's saying, God, would you stop dragging your feet? Would you get back in the action? I would say if you're going to talk to God like that, uh, you should do it respectfully, right? Oh, trust me, I've been here many times, frustrated with God. I know he's there, I know he's working, but I'm human and finite, and it's God, it's, I don't, whoa! Could you, could you stop sitting around? But I would say do it with respect. You might want to preface your remarks by telling God you, you're having issues, and for him to be, could you be patient while I share my heart? What's he share? Verse four, he gets into it, well, he says, your enemies roar like lions, he's saying, in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees and how they break down its carved work, speaking of the temple, all at once with axes and hammers. They're trashing everything in the temple. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, he said, I could hear him chanting, let us destroy them all together. Let's burn it to the ground, man. He says, they have burned up all of the meeting places of God in the land. You name it, any place where we gathered as Jews to worship you, they burned it. I mean, they got everything. See, this is, this is the devil. Anything that stands in his way, that smacks of that which stops his advance of evil, oh, you need to destroy that. You need to sideline that. See, once the Babylonians got inside the temple and saw all the beauty of the temple, the beautiful carvings, the gold, the silver, the beauty when they walked into the holy place, when they went into the most holy place and saw the cherubim and the Ark of the Covenant and they saw all of this, they had axes in their hands. They had axes. They chopped up and destroyed everything that which was holy. Remember Uzzah back in the Old Testament when he just happened to touch the Ark of the Covenant when it was falling off a cart of oxen? He just stuck his hand out. What God do to him? Killed him on the spot. Don't touch my stuff. Whoa, what's God doing? He's permitting the Babylonians to just not only touch it, but to use axes to destroy it, all of it. And anything that was worth anything, they hauled it back off to Babylon. It's unbelievable. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 25, if you want to read it after church today, uh, recounts step by step what they did, in great detail what they did. And they were like hungry lions roaring on the temple platform and destroying anything and everything. And he says they hung their militaristic flags in the temple. Imagine, you got the big curtain between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place with the cherubim woven into it and everything. And, and what are they doing? They're hanging Babylonian flags for their army over those things. Unbelievable. You know, for any saint looking at the burning of the temple and, and the mocking laughter of the godless troops, that must have been the day of all days. That must have been a hard one to process. I mean, I can't imagine being there. But for 490 years, God had called his people to repent, and they did not repent. And so he had to discipline his people. And when he disciplined the culture for not following the law and worshiping other gods, the godly remnant among them was part of all of that. They had to be there to see it. That's what the psalmist is saying. God, here's what happened. Let me lay it out for you. The ruination, I, I got to see it. What, what would you have done if you're the psalmist in that day? I mean, I would say do what he did. He, he told the Lord who he knew loved him. He told the Lord it was painful watching the disintegration of godly things. I almost couldn't even watch it. And then he devolves into a request. Notice his request. We don't see signs. There's no longer any prophet, nor are there any among us who knows how long that this thing is going to last, he says, or how long will the adversary approach? Will the, the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. Remember the tunics that they had to wear? You know, no sleeves like ours. You could hide your hand inside your tunic. He's telling God, would you please take your hands out of your tunic and get with the program? You see how frustrated he is? Who, as a godly person watching godless things advance, doesn't get frustrated at the advancement of evil? And I'm not talking about any one given party here, if you're thinking that. I'm talking about evil in general. Does it not discourage you? Does, does it get you to the point where you want to tell God, please do something? That's what he's doing. 
He's saying, God, it's time to put, pull your hands out. We don't hear from a prophet anymore. Now think about it. When the country fell, they had two main prophets. They had uh, Elijah, or not Elijah, they had uh, Jeremiah, and they had Ezekiel. They had two prophets. There might have been a lull in prophetic action as the nation fell and those prophets were carried into captivity. Uh, but he's saying, it sure feels like I don't hear your voice anymore. We used to have a prophetic word. Because remember, there weren't multiple scrolls back then of books. There might just have been a few of like Isaiah or Jeremiah. He's saying, God, we, we need a word. You know, when you see evil advance, you, you, well, one of the positive things is you do see that you need a word from God. You do need to be in the word of God. Why? Well, it's the word of God that gives the hurting soul answers. It's the word of God that gives the hurting soul hope for the future. You know, it's the word of God that uh, tells, tells you that the advancement of the wicked will not be forever. It's only momentary. Hang in there. You know, I have great hope. Why? Because I vacillate between the emotions of what I see in battling evil and the theology I know is true. And this over here helps me with this over here. What do I know? What do I know? I, I know that spiritual light will overcome darkness. I know that truth shall prevail. I know Christ shall appear. And I look forward to the day. In the meantime, I'm like the psalmist in Psalm 74. God, I gotta share with you my emotions. I gotta share with you how I feel. I gotta put my request before you. I, I've, gotta, I've gotta get into it and, and be honest with you. Are you honest with God? Because remember, he's your heavenly father who listens to you. How many times have you asked God, Lord, I need a word. See, I don't just study sermons. I can do it, I can do it because I've trained to exegete and all that stuff. I can do it robotically. But it's not about that. It's about when you get to the end of the study and you look at God and you say, God, okay, I've done all this study, but I need a word from you. I need to hear from you. And you know what? I, the last 32 years that I've preached, God always gives a word. He always shows up and gives a word. He gives a word. Because he knows we need words from him for assurance. Uh, if you're feeling frustrated and fearful uh, and you're feeling like the psalmist, it's okay. Because you need to work through those emotions in a real authentic way before God because God's listening and God will act. He switches gears in verse 12 and goes from the negative to the positive. Aren't you ready for the positive? I am. What's the positive? Verse 12. It's the remembrance. See, when you get down into evil and you're battling evil, it really pulls you down. And you can, it can cause you to forget about the greater things about God because you're too busy looking at the evil. He says, no, I, I had to get to the point where I had to stop and remember my faith and who God is. Notice what he says. Who does he see is God? How does he view God? What does he say about God? God is what? Who's king? He's my king. He's my king. Uh, is the verbiage there important? Uh, you better does is my king. It's present tense. God is my king. Now, you can't see it in the English text. It might be italicized in your English text of your Bible. There's no is there. It's called ellipsis. He left the verb out of the sentence. Why? To totally emphatically say, in light of all of I've seen and the pain and woe I've had to suffer watching evil advance, but I know one thing. You're the king. You are major the king. You are always the king. From how long ago? Old. Ancient times. Translated, God, you're beyond time and space. And if God is that great, and notice he uses the name God here, capital G, small O-D, that's Elohim. First time it's used is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, ha Elohim, God, the creator, created the heavens that we see. The point being, he's telling God, God, you are my king, and you're the, you're the creator king. So if you created all things, and you're outside of time and space, and you made all of this, well, you've got my issue. You've got my problem. You've got my world. It's going to be okay. God is the king. See, if you over-focus on the evil, you can forget who's on the throne of all things. God Almighty. What does God know? He knows Every fish swimming in every body of water, doesn't he? How many times I have prayed fishing, God, guide that little fish to my pole. Liz will attest to the fact, I did this once in Texas when I was, in, when I was working on my, starting to work on my doctorate in Hebrew. Uh, I was at a lake with some friends, and I was up like most of the night fishing. I actually prayed, God, all the fish in this whole lake in Texas are yours. Could you let your servant have one? 
guess what? Next morning, my wife's like, who are the fish? They're in the lake. They're not on my pole. You know, it's a spiritual issue, this fishing thing. God, God is this great. He's my king. He's king over my life. He's king over a fish. I mean, he's king over everything. Do you actually believe that? Because if you do, that puts a, a hop in your step. Because he's always your king. What does a king do? He's always working. This is what it says. He's working salvation in the midst of the earth. He's working salvation. Remember, I've told you for 12 years, grammar is important. Here's a case in point. He's working. It's a participle. He's working. You have two options in the Hebrew grammatical analysis. You have two options with a participle of this nature. It's either a iterative present or a durative present. I'll give you the two connotations because you're like, what does that mean? Iterative means if God is working, he's always working behind the scenes to occasionally jump into world history and do some amazing things. But you got to give him the chance to set stuff up. Iterative. He shows up occasionally. Durative well, should mean exactly what it means. He's always working and performing things of great salvation. And this word salvation is like Yeshua, Yasha. It's like Jesus. He's always See, the devil wants you to so focus on the advancement of evil, you're thinking all hope is lost, and you feel like the psalmist in the first 11 verses. And the psalmist is like, no, remember who God is. He's the king. And if he's the king, he's working. Have you forgotten he's working? Even in the mess of our country, what is God saying on his throne? I'm working. Give me a break. My hands are out of my tunic. I'm not dragging my feet. I'm working. He says, God, help me to remember who you are. You're the king. And then he says, Let me re let's just remember. Let's go down memory lane about how great you are. Because we tend to forget how great God is when he brings salvation. So he says, let's just take a brief perusal of history. Well, what does he see? Verse 13. You, God, divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces. And you gave him as food to the people of the inhabiting of the wilderness. I mean, basically, without getting into all of what all that means, Leviathan, the sea monster, and all that stuff, I'm, I'm just going to summarize because for sake of time, because there's another church service coming. He divided the sea. What sea did he divide? Mm, one, one. It's an easy Bible trivia question, isn't it? What sea did he divide? The Red Sea. Uh, you saw the movie with Cecil B. DeMille? Uh, yeah, Charlton Heston, standing out there with the staff. Behold, see the power of God. Foom. The waters part. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Here comes the chariots. All these crazy soldiers are closing on you with their weaponry. They're going to run over you. Also, in the water parts, two million of you cross on dry land. And you get to the other side, and all of a sudden, they go into the, 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 the dry land of the riverbed, and it all of a sudden just folds on them. Egypt's gone. No wonder God says in Isaiah that the nations are a drop in the bucket to him. They're nothing to him. He says, God, I, I, I'm forgetting in, in the fall of my nation that you're the God who parted the seas, which means if you can part water, you can do anything when you're ready to do it because you're a God of salvation. Have you forgotten that power of God? He says, verse 15, he says, you broke open the fountain and the flood. If you, if you did a word search on these, you will find they're used in the Hebrew text of uh, Genesis 7, 11, and, and Genesis 8, 2 the flood of Noah. I mean, he says, oh yeah, let me, let me go back further in, in biblical history. God, there was the Exodus where you parted the water. And by the, word, by the way, the water, the sea that he parted, the Red Sea, is Yom. Yom is a key deity in the Canaanite pantheon. He just took the God Yom and split it into totally dominated Yom. But he says, let me go back in history and let's study the, let's study the Noahic flood. Remember, God, you, you took that old man, Noah, in the middle of nowhere, far from water, and the world's surrounded by this vapor canopy. And, you know, no one's seen floods before, and you have him build a boat, and he calls people to repent for year after year after year. You, you broke open the fountain and the flood. You broke open the fountains of the deep, the pressurized water inside the earth. You broke up all that pressurized water, dropped the vapor canopy, flooded the earth, but you delivered Yeshua. You saved Noah and his sons and their wives. Wow, that must have been totally awesome to watch. Sad as well, as people who were not prepared knocked on the outside of the door of the ark as the waters rose. Let us in. Now it's too late. The day for repentance is over. 
but God, you brought salvation. Have you forgotten God is that powerful? But if you think about it, what's the time expanse between the Noahic flood and the parting of the Red Sea in 1446? Thousands of years. What's that tell you about God working salvation? He takes his time. And you're so patient, correct? Yeah, you're like me, Georgia. Isn't it the truth? You are God. Get your sandals moving. What's God saying? I am. It just takes me a while. Have faith. He then says in verse 16, Lord, the, the day is yours, the night is yours. You've prepared the light and the sun. You've set all the borders of the earth. You've moved all of the, the tectonic plates around to form the nations. Uh, you, you've made the summer, the winter. You started all this. You govern all this. Why am I worried? If you can create the sun with the word of your mouth and, and make it function at 27 million degrees constantly, and it doesn't fry the earth, although it does feel sometimes like it does here in July, um, God, how powerful you are. If you're that powerful, why am I worried at the advancement of the wicked? I shouldn't be because your power is displayed in the heavens above me, and you've put the nations exactly where you want them for your purposes. I need to trust you because of who you are. I'm going to submit to you what you need to be doing in turbulent times. That's remembering the stories of the word of God of who God is. You need to be really pouring out over them and saying, God, you're always working. May I tell my children, may I tell my grandchildren how great you are so they do not forget. And then lastly, he sums up everything with a request. It's a long request. He moves through it quickly. He has six, six things he wants from God. Number one. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. God, do not forget what the blasphemers say against you. You know when there's a, there, there's a tragedy? I'm always shocked that when people get together to pray, now there are those groups of people who mock the people who pray. Do you notice? You know what I mean? I'm fearful of, for the people who mock those who pray. He says, God, remember those who blaspheme. Uh, the, the word means to say evil, cursed things. Remember them and take action, too. Uh, oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. God, we're like a little turtle dove. We're like a dove. We're innocent. You know, we've repented of our sin. And, and don't let a beast devour us. Because I know you love us. I know you're the Father. Please step in. Three, he remembers the word of God. Have respect to the covenant for the dark places of the earth are full of haunts uh, of cruelty. What covenant? Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, Palestinian covenant that gives Israel the land, uh, the Davidic covenant that gives them a king of all kings for all time, the Messiah, in five, the new covenant that gives Israel a new heart and saves people. Jesus, you just partook of communion this morning as the new covenant. What are you saying? God, you made this deal with us, this covenant. We know you're good for it. May we see it. Four, his concern for others. Oh, don't let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and the needy praise your name. God always has a heart for the oppressed. Be who they may. Whether you're oppressed at the Pentagon, oppressed wherever you are, God says, my eye's on you. He says, don't forget the oppressed. Five, he circles back to God's person. Arise, O oh God, plead your own cause. Remember how foolish man reproaches you daily. God, I know you are patient, and it takes a long time for you to set things up, but, but would you remember to step in because of what they're saying about you? Defend yourself. Six, don't forget the voice of your enemies. The tumult of those who raise up against you increases continually. Boy, does it. He says, God, don't forget the voice of those who speak against you. Remember, remember with action. One day, God does remember with action. Today's the day of grace where God calls sinners to repent and come to him. And in the meantime, if you're a saint uh, who's fearful, uh, worried, and you're in the 11 verses of this psalm, that's okay. I'm there occasionally myself. But you want to live on the other side. Verses 12 and following, remembering who God is, rehearsing how great he is to yourself, to your family, and praising him for who he is, and knowing beyond all doubt he's a God of salvation who delivers, and he needs to hear from you because he's waiting to move. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, just for the complexity of a psalm like that, and it's so pertinent to the day in which we live, uh, and really in my lifetime, uh, you could drop that psalm at various decades, and it would be most powerful. Thank you that it speaks even today. Might we, your people, remember how great you are and have a great love and compassion for those who don't know you. 
and have a great joy of what lies ahead, knowing that your kingdom is coming. May we pray to that end, and might we live as such great lights that people are turned to the Christ, the King of Kings. Amen.